Hello everyone and welcome back to Dentrix Tree. In this video, I'm not really going to talk about the ideal tooth preparations and the preparation guidelines, but some important points and clinical tips to improve your preparations and get them right every single time. So let's get started. First point that I would like to stress on is to replicate the original tooth anatomy. It is often said that a tooth preparation should look like a miniature of the original and this mainly holds true for the occlusal aspect. So when reducing the occlusal surface, it is imperative to follow the pre-existing cuspal inclines. Imagine you have a flat occlusal table. What will happen? One is that your retention and resistance form is compromised and your crown will easily get dislodged. Also, a flat occlusal preparation will result in either an excessive amount of reduction or an insufficient clearance. In such a case, the resultant crown in some areas will be too thin, increasing the chances of perforation. Whereas, following the original tooth form will give you adequate clearance without excessive tooth reduction. Next, preparation depends on the type of crown. Whether it is an anterior or posterior preparation, the first thing you do is Decide which type of crown you are giving to the patient. So evaluate clinically for aesthetics, restorability, the amount of tooth structure you have and give the options to the patient to decide. Your preparation should depend on the crown you are restoring the tooth with. Whether it is a metal, porcelain fused to metal or metal ceramic, zirconia, emax, depending on the type of material, you prepare the tooth. For example, a PFM or a porcelain fused metal will require more reduction compared to a zirconia or metal as these are made of two layers that is a metal coping and an outer porcelain layer. So it is essential to prepare according to the material of the crown. The next point I would like to stress on is occlusal clearance. This is one of the steps that most people go wrong with. Visual inspection isn't always enough to determine the amount of clearance. This is what can be done to ensure almost every single time that you don't get it wrong. So take some modeling wax, roll it into a strip of 2-3 to mm thickness, either in the hot water or over the flame, and place it in the patient's mouth where you have done your preparation. Ask the patient to bite tightly. Remove the wax and inspect. Number one rule, make sure you don't see any perforations in the wax, because that is indicative of inadequate reduction. A very important tool to keep in your practice is this wax cage. You can measure the thickness of the wax after you remove it from the patient's mouth. Make sure it is adequate. You'll need at least 2 mm clearance for a PFM crown and 1.5 to 1 mm for a metal or a zirconia crown. Another way to predictably measure the clearance is by using these preparation gauges, also called as fleximeter strips. They come in different sizes of 1, 1 1.5 and 2 mm. While we are on this topic, we need to also make sure that the functional cusp bevel is properly placed. What is functional cusp bevel? As the name suggests, it is a bevel on the functional cusp. Simple, for maxilla, for the functional cusp is on the palatal and for mandible, it is a buccal cusp. Why is it necessary? Basically, the functional cusp receives the maximum force. So, to add to the strength and durability of the crown, you need to reduce an extra 0.5 mm on the functional cusp incline to provide space for adequate bulk of metal or ceramic in that area. Coming to another important point, adequate axial reduction. Just like we discussed for occlusal reduction, it is necessary to have adequate buccal or labial reduction as well. Let us take a look at this picture. What do you think is wrong here? bulky over contour crown right looks very anesthetic too so what went wrong here the technician did a bad job right no this happens because you haven't prepared enough we fail to provide enough space for the crown and expect the dental technicians to do a marvelous job it doesn't work that way guys for example if you want to give a zirconia crown you reduce only 0.5 millimeters labially while your crown needs a space of 1.2 millimeters, your technician is forced to prepare an over contour crown. I hope you have understood this. So please pay attention to the amount of reduction and remember you have to work in synergy with your technician. Also, another thing that you need to keep in mind is the two plane reduction of the labial surface of the anterior teeth. For your anterior teeth, 
the label reduction should always be carried out in two planes. One is along the long axis of the cervical portion of the anterior tooth, parallel to the incisal two-third of the facial surface. What will happen if you follow only one plane? So if the reduction is done in a plane parallel to the cervical, it may result in insufficient space in the incisal half, giving us an over-contoured restoration. And if it is reduced only parallel to the incisal plane, you may come dangerously close to the pulp. Moving on, for a perfect tooth preparation, we need well-defined gingival margins. Have you ever wondered why? It is for your technician. If the margin is not prominent, the technician will not know where to end the crown. Then what happens? Either your crown is too short or it impinges on the gingiva. So, once the proper reduction is done, it should ideally be followed with a gingival retraction to precisely capture your margins in your impression. And also the impression has to be spot on. Make sure that the margin is smooth and continuous because a rough margin would result in larger amount of micro leakage at the tooth prosthesis interface which in turn compromises the long-term prognosis of the tooth. Also, make sure that there is no unsupported enamel. Uh, this happens especially in case of your chamfer margins. The chamfer margin should never be prepared wider than half the tip of the diamond burr. Otherwise, an unsupported lip of enamel is formed. And when that happens, this unsupported enamel is going to chip off and you will get an inaccurate fit of the crown. Next. Do not over prepare the tooth. If it becomes short or loses its parallelism, the retention of the crown is compromised. I'm sure you all have heard of taper. We all have learned that the axial walls of the preparation must taper slightly to permit the restoration to seat. According to the latest articles, a taper of up to 10 to 20 degrees have been shown to be clinically acceptable. So how do we manage to remain within that range? It's no rocket science guys. You need a tapered flat or a tapered round burr to make sure that you have that minimal taper. The trick here is to hold the burr parallel to the tooth surface being prepared. Any inclination of the burr towards the tooth will result in an over tapered preparation and away from the tooth will result in undesirable undercuts. So you have to be very cautious with the inclination of the burr. The last thing that I would like to mention is to make sure you do not leave behind any sharp line angles and point angles in the preparation as it can lead to major fit problems and time consuming appointment during cementation. This happens because the pointed edges chip off from the cast once retrieved and the technician fabricates the prosthesis on the defective model. So the fit of the final crown that you get is definitely compromised. Also. Smooth axial walls allow the impression material to flow and record the detail of the preparation with accuracy. So, you have to round off all the sharp line angles and point angles at the time of tooth preparation. With this, we come to the end. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel. Always remember, if you fail to deliver an excellent clinical result, followed by a perfect impression, the result will suffer and it is your fault. You cannot expect your lab to do a great job if you have not done your part well.